Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here in this afternoon in Florence. Jean-Philippe Bouchot who is going to give us a seminar about a very interesting topic. Uh, let me just first before that this is uh, the first plenary colloquium of, organized by the Italian Society of Statistical Physics in presence. After COVID time, we decided to make less of this colloquium, but just to make them in one place, obviously many people can uh, be, uh, can attend the seminar from uh, online, but uh, uh, this is the first time we experiment this, uh, this form, format. And these have been co-organized with the Department of Physics and Astronomy of the University of Florence and with the Florence section of Institute Nazionale di Fisica Nucleare. And uh, this is worth mentioning because uh, all they provided their support and interest for this uh, event. Uh, Jean-Philippe is a very renowned uh, theoretical physicist. He has given a lot of contributions in statistical mechanics, mainly in the direction of uh, uh, dissolving È stato mutato il microfono. Scusate. Uh, Okay. So he gave a lot of contributions, very important contribution in the field of statistical mechanics. But Jean Philippe also uh, has been uh, one of the pioneers that tried to approach to approach problems of interest for application in finance coming from uh, our discipline. And uh, nowadays he is the chair of a very important company. And this proves that he is uh, successful not only in physics, but also in the field of finance. And uh, what he's going to speak about today essentially will explain to all of us which are the basic points of the problem. Thank you, jean -Pierre. Thank you for your nice introduction. I'm sorry not to be able to speak Italian. It's really ridiculous to... I'm French and you're Italian. I'm, I'm sure you, most of you speak French and I don't speak Italian. But anyway, this is how it goes these days. Um, so, well, first of all, let me thank the organizers for having me here in Florence. Florence is uh, just a delight and it's uh, great to be here anyway. So, uh, giving this talk is another occasion to, to come here. So, this is a kind of review talk of things that have been going on for maybe at least 10 years, maybe a little more, with a variety of, of people. And I won't quote all of them in, in all details when I go through the presentation. But, uh, well, as you can see, there are a few Italians in the list. Uh, so most of these people are actually coming from uh, statistical physics. Many of them are, have been PhD students. And, uh, um, and Carl, Carl uh, Naumann is uh, trained as an economist. Uh, but apart from that, I think most of them are trained in physics. So I'm going to, to talk about economics and in particular economics in the face of complexity and how statistical physics can give at least methods to approach uh, modeling in these uh, disciplines. And this subtitle I wrote, Tipping Points in, in Crisis, and I guess you'll understand why later on. Okay, so Theoretical economics traditionally is, is very axiomatic. Uh, so the, the main uh, issue about you know, modeling in economics is to come up with a, a representation of human behavior. And because it's hidden inside axioms, people don't really realize, but actually there's a lot of politically loaded assumptions behind the ideas that underlie uh, classical economics. So the still standard paradigm, although as I'm going to try to uh, show, it's slowly moving in, in another direction, but the standard paradigm is that humans, that we need to uh, model if we want to predict anything about economics, agents are assumed to be rational calculators, 
we are assumed to optimize a sudden utility function that measures our happiness. And this, to the end of time, this counted uh, in the future, but, but still it's an optimization, an op open-ended optimization. And we also have to assume that others will do the same. So others, of course, the world is unknown, so there are probabilities, but we are all supposed to know about these probabilities of future events and agree on these probabilities. So we, we don't agree, of course, on the events that are going to uh, be realized, but at least we agree on uh, probabilities. And this is called common knowledge. And, and we have to assume this because otherwise, if we, don't, if we can't assume that other people are also rational, then we can't make any calculation. So assuming these very strong um, axioms, then people over the years have proven a certain number of things. And for example, economies are supposed to reach an equilibrium, providing optimal welfare to all. Financial markets are efficient, which means that pri market prices re reflect faithfully the value of companies without influencing this value. So it's just like a kind of external thermometer, if you want, measurement apparatus that doesn't influence its uh, object. And, and prices in financial markets are only supposed to move because of exogenous news. So in, these fra in this framework, markets and economic systems are, in theory, fundamentally stable. Only uh, external shocks can uh, make the system, for example, enter a crisis or uh, undergo a crash. And here I've, I've put two little stars. The first one is a sentence by Jean-Claude Trichet, who was the head of the uh, European Central Bank at the time. And this was just after the 2008 crisis, and he was reflecting on what had happened. And he said, models failed to predict the crisis and seemed incapable of explaining what was going on. In the face of the crisis, we felt abandoned by conventional tools. And if you, if, if you contrast this statement with uh, the statement of a well-known economist, Lucas, Robert Lucas, who was Nobel Prize in Economics, in 2009, again after the 2008 crisis, he said the 2008 crisis was not predicted because economic theory predicts that such events cannot be predicted, which I find a very strange statement. And maybe it's true that classical economics, and, and it is true that classical economics predicts that such events cannot be predicted, but I think this means that one has to think again. So, a proxy move, I guess this is appropriate here. Um, I'm going to go a little bit further in this uh, problem, uh, empirical problem, that actually markets and economies as a whole move far too, far too much uh, to be explained by what economists call fundamentals, that is, true exogenous shocks that affect the value of a company or the functioning of an economy. So there are two puzzles, one concerning financial markets, which uh, is known as the excess volatility puzzle. It's been around for uh, 40 years or so. Rob Schiller was one of the founder of this, uh, of this discipline, but many others. And so the basic observation is that if you look at large companies in the US, for example, or anywhere in the world, the stock price moves up and down by say 2% every day. I mean, it's huge if you think about it. How can the value of a company move so much from one day to the next? And even stronger uh, problem is that um, most jumps, I mean, these prices, they tend to jump all the time. It's not even a Gaussian process. They are, they are true jumps. And when you look into what made the prices jump, you realize that nothing happens actually in the world. And most of these prices, jump prices, they seem to come out uh, of nowhere. And so this is led, this is an, an old observation, as I said, 1982 Schiller, but also this paper here, Katla Patova and Summers, Larry Summers, maybe some of you know him, uh, in 1989 wrote that the evidence that large market moves occur on days without identifiable major news cast doubts on the view that price movements are fully explicable by news. So there would be a full seminar to give on uh, empirical observation related to this statement, but I just want to you know, state it as a fact and we can discuss later on if you want. And then there's the analog paradox for macroeconomies as a whole, if you want. And this is called the small shocks, large business cycle puzzles. And this sentence was coined by uh, 
Ben Bernanke, who was the head of the Fed, the US Fed. And the observation is that uh, naively, if you think of a large economy with firms that do their own stuff, then one of them might you know, be going up one year, another one goes down in terms of its production, say. But all these idiosyncratic shocks should average out. And so one expects naively that large economies should be stable and, very, uh, and with a very small volatility. But if you look at the aggregate volatility of uh, GDP, for example, it is, it is very high. For example, since the 50s in the US, the economy is, is grown by roughly 3% per year, but plus or minus 3% as a standard deviation. So they are, these are really huge fluctuations for the whole, uh, for, for, for a, a very large economy. And here I'm quoting another economist, Cochrane, who in 1994, so this, this puzzle is, is known for, has been known for a long time, and he says, what shocks are responsible for economic fluctuations? Despite at least 200 years in which economists have observed fluctuations in economic activity, we are still not sure. So you see it's really a parallel with financial markets. So things seem to move a lot, but nobody knows really why. So, for example, the big crisis of 2008, it's still debated what fundamental aspect could lead to such a huge uh, uh, recession. And the standard model that is used by um, central banks, uh, which, uh, to which Jean-Claude Trichet was referring to in the previous quote, is called DSG, Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium. So in this name, you should uh, focus on equilibrium. So the idea of these economic models is that economies reach equilibria, and then there's an exogenous shock that moves the equilibrium away and then some, somewhere else. But without exogenous shocks, things should be in equilibrium. And so the point is that these models, they're actually not equipped to deal with endogenous crisis, with the, the behavior of the system that could be generated by complex nonlinear dynamics. So one of the points that you know, is, is striking and that has been discussed for, again, many, many years, so it's, it's strange because there's classical economics that has been going on for many years and is still taught uh, as a 101 uh, for economic students, but still in parallel, there's a lot of people trying to knock on the door and say, well, we should probably revise all these things and do something else. But surprisingly, the old dogma is extremely resilient. And so what I'm saying here is not necessarily new. And the idea that, uh, for example, the rational uh, idea of modeling agents as rational uh, people is, is clearly uh, strange. This has been pointed out for a long time, for example, Keynes himself or Herbert Simon in the 50s and so on. But you know, when you think about this, it seems obvious that we are imperfect, we are heterogeneous, we're not all the same, we're grappling with complex problems and radical uncertainties. So radical uncertainty is uh, uh, meant to mean that, is, that you know, we're in a world where it's absurd to think of probabilities as shared by everybody, you know, everybody, because we don't even know the possible states of the world in the future. So this is, goes under the name of unknown unknowns. There are things we don't even know we don't know. And so how can we agree on probabilities when we don't even agree on the possible states of the world? We're also, as humans, we were not rational in the sense that we're not optimally uh, calibrating our behavior. We use rules of thumb. We're subject to a host of common behavioral and cognitive biases. And I've underlined common here because economists can say, okay, well, we're making mistakes, but you know, on average, on large populations, these mistakes average out. But the problem is that we're all subject to the same kind of biases. And so these are not averaging out. Uh, we're interacting with others. This will be a major theme in the rest of my talk. And so this leads to herding behavior. We tend to be uh, overconfident. We're influenced by past patterns. We think that what happened in the past will repeat. So this leads to trends. We overreact, we panic, and so on. So another route is taken by economists to try to save the rational uh, 
expectation framework is to say, okay, maybe we're not rational to start with, but we learn to be rational. We learn about our environment and through natural selection, so to say, we become as if we were rational. But actually, even that is uh, subject to uh, criticisms. And in particular, I'm citing here two papers by statistical physicists, Tobias Gala and Don Farmer in 2013 in PNAS, and ourselves in a, re in a paper that's going to come out in PRX with uh, Jérôme Garnier-Brun. We've studied you know, more, uh, complex games, complex situations, and we, we can show that in these situations, agents cannot learn. They, they just, it's, it's too complex. They find things that kind of work, that are satisfying, that is both satisfying and sufficing, but certain, certainly not optimal. So, as I said, there are more and more attempts to move beyond the classical law, even inside economics. And here I've copied the uh, front page of a journal called Economic Review of Econo uh, Oxford Review of Economic Policy. So this is, this is January 2018. And, and so you see the titles, for example, the Rebuilding Macroeconomic Theory Project. And here, a very interesting paper by Andrew Haldane, who was the head of research at the Bank of England, and Arthur Terrell, who is also a physicist, and they call for an interdisciplinary model for macroeconomics. So if you're interested, you can certainly read this paper. But we are not out of the woods yet. And if you think about the recent inflation episode that the major economies went through in the last few years, it's again an example of how far from reality these economic models are. I mean, if you followed a little bit the literature or even the, the, the general press, um, nobody understands why there was inflation, why inflation was not transient. It seems that it's still persistent after a few years. And it's amazing to see that even the basic mechanisms are not agreed on by economists. So here I want to uh, move to we learn from uh, statistical physics, which is the idea of emergent phenomena and phase diagrams. But before going there, I want also to, to quote Olivier Blanchard, who was head economist at the uh, IMF. And reflecting on the 2000 crisis, 2008 crisis, he wrote this paper, Where Danger Lurks, 2014, where he says, we in the field did think of the economy as roughly linear, constantly subjects to different shocks, constantly fluctuating, but naturally returning to equilibrium over time. The problem is that we came to believe that this was indeed the way the world worked. And so you see, this is a little cartoon of how DSG type models work. There's a marble in a bowl. And if you don't shake the bowl, then the marble goes at the bottom of the bowl. And the only way the marble can move is because the, the ball moves. And the ball moving is this exogenous uh, mechanism that I talked about. So I'm quoting here, Olivier Blanchard, just to insist on the fact that what I'm telling you is not you know, coming from my own thinking about the field. It's really something that economists themselves uh, say. They say, well, we think that everything is linear. We think that there's equilibrium. And we think that it's only exogenous shocks that can lead to these uh, problems. The main lesson of the crisis is that we were much closer to dark corners, situations in which the economy could badly malfunction than we thought. And I was interested by this dark corner idea that he expresses in this paper, because I think it's very close to what we would call in physics uh, phase transitions. So being in a, in, a, in a place where people know about statistical physics, you won't be surprised by what I'm going to say, but I still want to say it quickly. So the, the thing that is usual to, to say here is to quote, uh, Phil Anderson, this paper, More is Different, that it was written in 72. And for those of you who, has, who haven't uh, read it yet, it's, it's really a fantastic paper that is now better and better known outside the field of physics. And even economists uh, start uh, to, to, to reflect on, this, uh, on these ideas. So he says, so I've adapted his text a little bit to be in the context of uh, social sciences. The behavior of large assemblies of interacting individuals, so he says particles, cannot be understood as a simple extrapolation of the properties of isolated individuals. Uh, 
Instead, entirely new, unanticipated behavior may appear, and our understanding requires new ideas and methods. So what he's saying is that micro behavior and macro behavior do not coincide and that you can really find extremely surprising uh, macro behavior that cannot be anticipated naively if you look at things at the micro level. And we know a lot of examples of this. For example, superconductivity, how electrons can you know, conspire to uh, conduct electricity without dissipation. This is kind of miraculous, but we've come to uh, to, to, to know about these phenomena. There's the, the, the flashing of fireflies, which is also very spectacular, so I won't have time to read in detail this, uh, this quote by Strogatz, but the, the fact that fireflies are able to synchronize has been for many, many years, decades, a mystery. And it's only actually quite recently, since the end of the 60s, and, and more and more using uh, models for uh, neural networks and, and actually neurons in the brain that we understand how uh, individual objects, individual uh, oscillators can synchronize. So, of course, maybe the, one of the most uh, fascinating emergent phenomena is consciousness and memory that arises from inert uh, and very simple individual neurons. So, predicting the emergent properties uh, and phase diagrams of a system from the behavior, the simple behavior of its individual constituents is hard. We know it's not something simple, but it's, I think it's one of the trophy achievements of statistical mechanics. So in order to guide our intuition, a fundamental concept in statistical physics is, is the idea of phase diagrams in parameter space. So we all know about this phase diagram of, of uh, usual bodies, so there's a gas phase, a liquid phase, and a solid phase, and when you're close to the transition, then the same molecules can adapt at large scales, completely different behavior. So again, we all know this, and it's, it's, it's so trivial that we, can't, we don't even think about this, but if you reflect one second, it's actually completely non-trivial to have the same H2O molecules being liquid at zero plus, that is flowing in blue and, and solid at zero minus. So the lessons that we all know and take for granted uh, looking at a phase diagram is that well within one phase, the properties are qualitative, qualitatively similar. Not only when we move in the phase diagram of a given body, but also across different bodies. I mean, if you think about different liquids, they're all described by the Navier-Stokes equation and everything concerning the liquid is uh, summarized in a single parameter, which is the viscosity. So, uh, it seems that there's a large universality uh, 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 governing macroscopic, that is, aggregate properties that are extremely robust against changes in microscopic details. And I think this is very good news for modeling. I mean, again, we know that from physics, but if you think about social sciences, the fact that maybe only very few important properties survive at the aggregate level is uh, something that we should keep keep in mind because maybe it, it allows one to think that large uh, assemblies of human beings uh, can be modeled in a statistical physics type of way. But we also know that this robustness of behavior within a, a, a region of the phase diagram can be very fragile if we go near a phase transition. And then in the vicinity of a phase uh, transition, small changes can indeed have dramatic effects, like water going to ice. And I think in the language of statistical physics, that's what uh, Olivier Blanchard had in mind when he, when he talked about dark waters. That is, the proximity of points where you know, small changes can really uh, make the economy go haywire. So let me speak about this more in a in the macroeconomic concept uh, context, uh, speaking about agent-based models. So agent-based models is something that, again, in physics we do routinely because we know the agents, these are the, the, the molecules, the atoms, but it's, it's not so new, but still uh, not very well recognized in top journals, uh, a new way to do economics. So the idea is, is simply to you know, think that instead of 
postulating uh, human behavior to be simple enough to write equations and solve these equations analytically, maybe we should start by assuming simple rules for agents and simulating uh, virtual economies with you know, millions or thousands of firms and households. And here, again, this is not a surprise for us, but uh, I think Mark Buchanan, who's a scientific journalist, who wrote just again after the 2008 crisis, this is October 2008, and he was already at the time reflecting on the failure of economic theory to predict what was going on. He's advocating the use of computer simulations and he says done properly computer simulation represents a, a kind of telescope for the mind multiplying human powers of analysis and insight just as a telescope does our powers of vision and i think this is really true and and it's uh, a nail very accurately that's that's exactly why we need simulations we need simulations to imagine things that are not easy to grasp uh, without them. So that's what he says. With simulations, we can discover relationships that the unaided human mind or even the human mind aided with the best mathematical ana analysis would never grasp. So people have tried to do this and come up with uh, more and more complicated agent-based models trying to be as realistic as possible. But very quickly, you hit the problem, which is that uh, you need a large number of parameters to kind of encode what you want to uh, simulate. And even stylized models, the types that I'm going to speak about in one second, they have a relatively large number of parameters, like, like 10. And, uh, and it's a problem because you know, we know that in high dimensional space, uh, it's difficult to orient oneself and, and to be sure that one is uh, correctly calibrating or correctly representing uh, the world that one wants to represent. So it's that's why we usually like having a few parameters that is allowing us to have a, a good intuition about what's going on. Uh, and clearly when one sees the type of details that are encoded in these agent-based models, one shivers a little bit because maybe it's worse than what the economists are doing uh, because in the sense we're losing uh, I mean, we're trying to, if you, if you try to represent the, 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 if the map is equal to the territory, then, then you've lost, I think, the scientific method. Anyway, so uh, methodology that we've tried to apply to these macroeconomic agent-based models with um, uh, Italian colleagues in the, in the early 2010s, is to try to think in terms of phase diagrams. So I'm going to go to that in a second, but let me first give you an idea of the very fast agent-based models in economics, which was pr proposed by Thomas Schelling, and it's called the Schelling segregation model. So maybe some of you have heard about this because it illustrates very well the strengths and maybe weaknesses of agent-based models. So. Schelling was interested to understand why uh, there's racial segregations in some cities in the US and he came up with a, a very simple model where people do things uh, according to uh, their own interests, if you want, but at the end the, the macro result doesn't resemble what individuals are trying to do. And so here I'm giving you a, a slightly different uh, version of Schelling's model where people are not concerned by race, but they're concerned by the density of the neighborhood in which they're living. And so it, it's a model where agents would like to live in half crowded neighborhoods. So, you know, the idea is that two crowded neighborhoods is bad. Uh, neighborhoods where there's nobody is bad as well. There's no shops and no uh, cafe and so on. So they individually prefer living in neighborhoods that are half crowded. So this is the assumption of the model. So they have a utility function, if you want to speak like economists, that is maximum around uh, half density. And you start with a configuration where actually the state of the system is realizing this optimality for everybody with small fluctuation, though. There are neighbors that are slightly overcrowded and, and, and neighbors that are slightly undercrowded. And to your surprise, by applying a rule, individual rule, that seems to make a lot of sense, where people want to maximize their own utility function, then repeating the rule that people move neighborhood 
if they can find a neighborhood where their own utility is better, it leads to, to segregation. It leads to, in this case, 35% of the blocks that are completely empty and the other ones that are uh, overcrowded. So you know, it's really surprising. It's something that is completely counterintuitive, that individuals seem to do what they want to do, and in the end, collectively, it creates something that is not at all what's expected. So you can analyze this model using uh, statistical and physics type of ideas. This was done in this beautiful paper by Grovin, Jensen, and, and Bertin. And uh, formally, the system maps into a kind of liquid gas uh, model, and this segregation is akin to a liquid gas phase transition. So what I like about this model is that it's, you know, it really represents this surprising macro uh, behavior that I was in insisting on. It's also an example where the famous invisible hand of Adam Smith, where, you, you know, people following their own interests should lead to global welfare to all. Well, this is an example where it clearly badly fails. So, um, what I want to show now is the work that we've done with, uh, as I said, three Italian guys, Stanislav Guardi, Marco Tarzia, and, and Francesco Zamponi. Uh, we looked at a, a model that was uh, proposed by uh, Deligati and collaborators in Milano. Uh, so this, was, uh, this is a macroeconomic agent-based model, pretty detailed. But again, our concern was that they were finding phenomena that we didn't understand intuitively or didn't have a kind of uh, analytical grasp on what was going on. So we tried to stylize and, and simplify as much as possible uh, the, their model, what was called Mark 1, Mark 2, and so on. And so we called it Mark 0, a kind of primitive version of, the, of these models. And so in a nutshell, what we kept as ingredients is that in this economy, there are firms and households, and the firms, they adjust their workforce. So here, you only need labor to produce goods. So firms adjust their workforce or their production, they adjust their prices, they possibly adjust their wages in reaction to sales. And the, the rule is really simple and very intuitive. It's that, you know, if a firm has overproduced and wasn't able to sell its production at time t, at time t plus one is going to try to lower production and maybe lower prices. I mean, things very intuitive like this. And so in the face of imbalances, they hire and fire to adjust production. And something that turned out to be very important in the model is the ratio of the speed of hiring versus firing in the face of imbalances. So, you know, when, when you, need more production, do you hire quickly? And when you need to reduce production, do you fire slowly, which would lead to R greater than one, or vice versa? Are you quicker to fire when you need to reduce production than, uh, than you hire when you need to uh, increase production? And the second thing is that these firms, they make profits, but they also make losses depending on noise. I mean, there's noise in the system. And so we allow firms to survive until their accumulated debt exceeds a multiple M of the total sales. So the idea here is that, okay, as, as long as you're not making, as, as long as your debt is not too large and the banks allow to uh, give you the money to survive, then you, you, you can continue uh, functioning. But at one point, if your debt exceeds some threshold, the, the banks are going to cut your credit lines and you're going to default. So, so this is also a very important aspect of, of the model that we kept. And by the way, this idea that firms can default is nowhere in the, in the DSG type of framework that I talked about. Um, and so it turns out, and I'm going to try later if I have time to explain why these two parameters out of roughly 10 we uh, focused on because they seem to be the most relevant parameters in the model. And so we started drawing phase diagrams in the plane R, M. So R again is hiring versus firing and M is the amount of debt that you can, uh, that you allow firms to accumulate. And so what we found is a phase diagram, which is extremely robust against uh, 
micro assumptions. So, for example, do we allow firms to adapt wages or not? And all, all values of other parameters doesn't change the topology of this phase diagram. So there's a, a, a phase where the economy collapses. So if firms fire faster than they hire, then the economy falls uh, into pieces. There's a phase where hiring is, uh, is, is, is uh, active and then the economy survives, but it's subdivided in three different phases. One we call the residual unemployment because there's, uh, so that's the graph showing unemployment as a function of time. So you see the black line is the, corresponds, to, corresponds to the black phase. The economy collapses, so unemployment goes to 100%. Residual unemployment means that there's a non-zero unemployment in equilibrium or in stationary state. Full employment means that the unemployment rate goes to zero. And so here you see high fire firms hire faster than they fire. It's good for employment, but also they're allowed to survive even if they're in debt. And the fact of allowing them, I mean, giving them, them time to recover allows uh, the economy to, to thrive. But what we discovered, and that's the whole point of giving you this example, is that there's an intermediate phase, which we didn't expect at all, where there are what we call endogenous crisis. That is, there's a, it's a phase where the economy seems to be stable. There's a very low unem uh, unemployment. You don't even see here, it's the uh, green line. And then for no reason whatsoever, because there's no exogenous shocks in this model, uh, there's a spike of unemployment. The, the system seems to destabilize spontaneously and to enter a crisis phase. And you know, for a while, we didn't believe that this was happening in the model because we didn't see any reason for this to happen. And we really had to work a lot to understand that indeed it's not an artifact, it's not a bug of the, of, of the, of the code, it's something that we can actually understand by making a kind of model of the model, simplifying again the, the agent-based model, and coming up with equations that are exactly the same as the equation describing firefly synchronization. So that's why I insisted on fireflies earlier on. So they are, th there's a mechanism by which um, bankruptcy of one firm can propagate to other firms and lead to a kind of synchronization where all firms default at the same time. And so we were really surprised, but this is something that indeed can happen. And it helps you anticipating scenarios that are hard to imagine without the simulation. And then when you have the, res the results of the simulation, you can try to make sense of uh, what you found. So I'm not going to go into all the uh, generalization of this. As I said, it's, a, it's really a proof of concept model, but we still try to extend it and see what it had to say about various things that are of interest to economists, for example, monetary policy, how central banks should react to inflation. And what we found is that in some cases, monetary policy that tries to stabilize inflation can have unintended consequences and actually destabilize the system. We also found that uh, the equilibrium state, the state that economists think is kind of a natural state of the economy, is not at all in these models a natural state. It depends on the parameters. And depending on the parameters, you can be, for example, in a phase where inflation is high and there's high output, high production, or in a phase where there's low inflation and low output. It's the same technology, it's the same rules of production, if you want, but collectively the system can organize in one phase or the other. And this depends very much on, for example, the interest rate or behavioral parameters uh, that I don't want to uh, discuss here. So there's also, by the way, a hyperinflation phase, which uh, is, of course, something that everybody uh, dreads. And, uh, and in these kinds of models, you, you can fall into hyperinflation. There are also, also things that we know in statistical physics, like coexistence regions, that is, regions where the high inflation, high output, or the low inflation, low output phase are in principle possible, but depending on the initial condition, you can be in one phase or the other. And then, of course, when COVID struck, we were excited to see what our model uh, could uh, predict. And at the time, people were asking whether the um, 
the, the, the COVID-induced recession would be V-shaped or L-shaped. Uh, yeah. Maybe some of you re remember this uh, debate. So V-shaped means that there's a strong drop and then it recovers quickly to, and goes back to the previous equilibrium. And L-shaped means that it goes down and then it stays down. And so we run our model uh, depending on the, the severity of the, of the crisis. So COVID was both a demand shock and a supply shock. I mean, demand shock because people couldn't go out and shop and supply shock because people cannot go to work and, and produce. And so these are the two axes of this phase diagram. And what we find in, in the model is that there's a, a region of phase space where the recovery is V-shaped, but there's also a region in phase space where the recovery is L-shaped. And, and again, this idea that there are lines that distinguish two very different re regimes and that there's nothing you know written in stone and about the fact that the economy will recover and go back to equilibrium is, is something I think very interesting conceptually. And by the way, the SG type models that were run around the same time, they cannot do give you any other answer than the economy is, is going to go back to equilibrium because there's only one equilibrium. So uh, as I said, I mean, this, if you have the model in a bowl picture, well, there's a big shock, which is COVID, but then the marble has to go down. Whereas in more complex systems, you see that there are other possibilities. There are different equilibria, and depending on the dynamics, you can fall in one equilibrium or the other. So in the previous model, we have a very simple economy where firms only need labor to uh, function, but there's something that has become a very important theme in economics and also in policy making is the, is, the, is the notion of supply chains, is the fact that actually a firm to produce doesn't only need labor, of course, it also needs input goods. And so if you look at how the economy is working, actually there's a, a, a complex network of firms supplying to other firms uh, what they need to, to produce. And so since the, the beginning of the 2010, there's an intense activity in the economics literature to think about what can happen in uh, farm networks. And again, of course, one of the tools of classical economics is to think in terms of equilibrium, as I said. And so, for example, in this paper, which has already become very famous, by Asimoglu, Carvalho, et al., dates 2011, they compute the static equilibrium of the problem, and then they shock this equilibrium by exogenous shocks. As I said, this is a standard way to uh, compute uh, the volatility of, of the economy. And so what does it mean to compute equilibrium? It means that every firm optimizes its profit and so computes how much goods it, it has to buy from other firms. And then it also assumes that markets clear, which means that everything that is produced gets, sell, gets, gets sold at every time step. So you see it's a very, very strong assumption that uh, uh, firms are able to understand what's going on in the whole system to exactly calculate what they need and all the markets are able to clear at every instant of time. So there's no stock out, so there's no missing ingredient, there's no inventories. And so you're supposed to describe the fluctuations of the economy based on the idea that there's equilibrium at each time step. And the only thing that changes from one time step to the next is, for example, technologies or exogenous shocks that move the equilibrium. So these papers are still interesting because they show that um, network effects can increase the fluctuations compared to what would happen if you had individual firms. So this goes in the direction of explaining this large business cycle, small shock, large business cycle effect that I mentioned at the beginning, but it's, it's clearly not enough. So what we try to do with uh, Théo Desserten, José Moran and Michael Benzaken is to extend these farm network models by not assuming equilibrium, but rather assuming simple rules by which firms might find equilibrium. So again, it's it's a it's it's very close to what I said previously. It's an agent-based model like dynamical extension of these models where firms 
well, they see that last time step, they weren't able to sell everything. And so they are going to reduce production and reduce mm -hmm. prices and so on. And But now there's this network effect that when one firm does something, it's going to affect uh, in the network another firm and so on. So again, this is using plausible heuristic rules. Our firms are not these infinitely rational, forward-looking agents that economists want to think about. So you know, you could say, well, you know, firms don't do that. Firms try to think very hard about what they are doing. Well, you know, let me say two things. First of all, again, the, the problem is so complex. I mean, what your suppliers are doing and what the suppliers of your, of your suppliers are doing and so on become so complex that you you can only do myopic things. And second, having been involved in running a company for now nearly 30 years, I can tell you that there's a lot of kind of rules of thumbs and irrational decisions that are made at every time step. Anyway, so, so we try to extend, as I said, dynamically, but also take into account inventories, perishability, stockouts, because as soon as you don't assume market clearing, then you have to do something which, which, with what's left. And, and so it, it, it clearly in, increases the number of variables and makes the problem much more complicated. And, and you understand why economists don't, do, don't want to do this, because suddenly the problem becomes much more complicated. But anyway, you can again do this numerically. And what you find is, depending on the parameters, you find again a phase diagram, which is really interesting. So here in the x-axis is a parameter that describes the strength of restoring forces, which means that firms realize that they've overproduced. How quickly are they going to try to reduce production? So this is the x-axis. And the y-axis is perishability. That is, if you have inventories, how long is your inventory going to survive? So if you, of course, if you're producing fresh food, perishability is very high. But if you're producing, I don't know, production machines, then perishability is going to be very low. And in this phase diagram, we find that there's a blue region here, which is the region that economists like. That is, the dynamics spontaneously leads to equilibrium, to the equilibrium that economists uh, calculate. And so if this convergence to equilibrium is fast enough, then it makes sense to think that the dynamics of the economy is a succession of equilibrium states. This is what we would call in physics uh, kind of adiabatic assumption. But you see that there are many other things that can happen in this economy. And in particular, there's this big yellow phase where people tend to overreact to imbalances where you enter uh, a, a very complex type of dynamics where the equilibrium is never reached. It's not that the equilibrium has disappeared. The equilibrium is there in all the, the phase diagram. But you, you, you're ne never able to reach it. And you, you enter either into a kind of business cycle with uh, firm production and prices oscillating or even chaotic dynamics where uh, the system is, is completely unpredictable. So that what, that's what one would like to call turbulence in firm networks. And you see it's another completely different scenario for this small, small shot, large business cycle puzzle of Bernanke in the yellow phase, you don't need any exogenous shocks to have permanent disequilibrium and permanent fluctuations. So I think it, it would be a very interesting next step to try to identify in data signatures of uh, turbulent behavior. So of course there are hints of that, but it's not clear at this stage that this is the correct uh, scenario. So if I still have five minutes five or, or 10 minutes, is is that okay? Uh, I want to give you a, a last chapter on something that we've worked on very recently with uh, Max Nicker, uh, Karl Naumann, Wolske, and Michael Bendaken, is uh, how to navigate large dimensional phase diagrams. And we rely on, on, on the idea that was uh, proposed by Jim Setna a few years, well, maybe 15 years ago, of uh, sloppy models. So, as I said, models are generally high dimensional. These agent based models, macroeconomic agent based models, are high dimensional. And the model, Mark Zero model that I've alluded to, is already large dimensional because it has like 10 parameters. But what Setna proposed and tested on, on a variety of different models 
is that most models are sloppy in the sense that if you look at the loss function as a function of, of parameters, the loss function, so for example, you want to fit data, so there's an optimal set of parameters, and then you can look at the curvature around this optimal uh, set of parameters. Uh, so if you have 10 parameters, you, you can construct a 10 dimensional, 10 by 10 matrix, which is the Hessian of the loss function around the optimal point. And then you can diagonalize this Hessian matrix and see what are the directions that matter in the sense of fitting and what are the directions that don't matter. And so this is a standard analysis of, of fitting, but what they realize is that generically, if you do this, if you diagonalize the Hessian matrix for a variety of, of models, I can't even read what they've written here, uh, but you see that this is log scale on the uh, y-axis. These are the eigenvalues of the Hessian matrix. And what you see is that the top one is normalized to one, and the second one is usually a large factor smaller. And then the next one is still smaller and so on. So it means that there's a hierarchy of directions. There are stiff directions that you can't neglect because they're important in the construction of the model. But there are also a lot of sloppy directions in which, in fact, you don't care about the value of the parameters. So that's what I wrote here. Maybe it's not parameters themselves, but it's at least a combination, linear combination of parameters that are relevant, and many other uh, linear combinations of parameters are completely irrelevant. So we, we use this to try to explore the phase space in an optimal way. That is, if you follow, if you, if you at each point, you diagonalize the Hessian matrix and you follow the stiff directions, then you're going to go in your numerical exploration in directions that kind of matter and not lose your time wandering around directions that don't change uh, anything. So if you remember, I told you that these parameters M and R are the uh, are, are important parameters. So at the time with uh, Francesco, Marco and Stanislaw, we did it by, by hand. But now there seems to be so this is, this is work that is still ongoing, and I think there's a lot of potential in, in using these types of ideas to explore the phase space of, of large dimensional models. But you can uh, use this to revisit the Mark Zero and uh, try to see how optimally to probe these phase diagrams and see where, are the, where, is, the, where, where is the action. So let me conclude in, uh, in, a, in a single slide about the idea that macroeconomics or other situation in social sciences are so complex that maybe what we need is to reduce our ambition, not try to predict numbers, but rather to predict scenarios, that is predict qualitative scenarios. So I've tried to argue that establishing the phase diagrams of agent-based models is, is a crucial first step to understand what's going on in the model before trying even to use it to calibrate and predict. And in particular, there's a lot of things that arise in these agent-based models that are truly surprising in the sense of, of Anderson. And, and so I usually argue that these computer-aided experiments, they are of genuine value because if we're not able to make sense of an emergent phenomenon in a world where we created all the rules, then it's doubtful that we'll be able to understand uh, anything in the real world. So I think it's just for an intellectual uh, preparation for understanding the real world, it's really an interesting to do these numerical experiments. And this the idea of numerical simulation is actually not well uh, um, accepted in economics departments and it's not well taught at all at least in in many of them and i think that in order to uh, teach young students to think about the world uh, numerical simulation is is very useful so again i'm preaching the choir here because we as physicists we we know this is true but as i i remember one uh, year going to um uh, university in the Netherlands, in Maastricht, actually. And at, at the end of my talk, I met with students and they all asked me about what is numerical simulation. They had never heard about this 
idea. So it's really something that I think needs to be again popularized. Um, so I, I've shown you that agent-based models, they reveal the existence of these so-called black swans, that is things that we think are inherently unpredictable, but sometimes these things that are inherently unpredictable, in they're not at all. They're actually just a signal that we lack imagination to imagine them. And so these agent-based models, they reveal lines and, and dark corners beyond which uh, runaway instabilities appear. And what's interesting is that most classical finance or economic models, they're completely blind to such scenario. Again, there's a unique equilibrium and nothing much can happen except for exogenous shocks that you don't try to e even understand. And that was the, the, the meaning of what I told you earlier on about uh, the fact that economic theory predicts that these things cannot be predicted. Because if you think that everything is due to unpredictable exogenous shocks, then you know you just put the pen down and it's over. So you know, having said all this, um, yeah, well, I've also insisted on the fact that phase diagrams are very stable, and this is really interesting in terms of uh, modeling. So my, my proposal is that in the face of a complex environment, one should create tools to help our intuition and to help the way to communicate this, this intuition. And I think that the intuition that comes out of these agent-based models is much more useful than the intuition that comes out of the classical TSG model. And of course, once we've identified catastrophic scenario that could possibly happen, well, we should think about whether they are realistic or not. But at least policymakers or risk managers, they, they should really think hard about these things. And so, Again, if you think back about inflation, that's something I, I didn't boast about, but uh, when, when we wrote our paper in June 2020 on, uh, on COVID and applying this Mark Zero model to COVID, we found, and we were really surprised that we were able to use policy to save the economy, say, but we found systematically that after the, the crisis, there was excess inflation. And so you can read the paper, we mentioned that. And so it's not to say that we predicted inflation. We just said, hey, maybe there's a, a scenario here where there's going to be inflation. And I think it's, it's just a way to open the eyes of some people who are in charge of you know, thinking about these things professionally and say, maybe it's a, it's a channel that you haven't thought about and you should you know, it either argue why this channel is actually absent in the real economy or if you think that there's a, a, a small chance that this, man, this channel is actually present, maybe you should really think hard about it. And so, you know, the idea is to change from a, a, a habit of having models with many parameters that you try to calibrate and to come up with numbers about next year's inflation to the second decimal digit to uh, something that's much more qualitative, but maybe much more useful. And here I want to quote Keynes again, who understood everything a long time ago. And he said at the time, it's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. Thank you for your listening. Probably they use the chart to... No, 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 they can participate. Okay. Just um, remove the sharing. For the moment, at least. So let's... Uh, uh, maybe I will need... The, uh, maybe I will need the, the, the slides to... Yeah, you, you, okay. can, you can, oh, go, I can go back and share again. Ah, okay, okay, okay. If there are questions. Let's privilege people from uh, the online attendance. If they want to raise any question, please, now is your time. Yeah. Uh, oh. Just me, maybe they got it. Okay. 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 Okay.
expliquer. Euh... Sloppy. Sloppy. Uh, I didn't understand very well how you conclude this uh, essay. So would you have a data from something that you fit with the model, and then every... I, I can explain. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so, so, should I back on? So the question is, how do we use actually the sloppy idea? So either you have data and that was the suggestion of Sethna, and you so you fit the data so you have a loss function which is how good is your fit you find the optimal set of parameters so you're at a maximum and then you you compute the second the matrix of second derivatives with respect to parameters but if you have a model you can use the same idea by having the data generated by the model itself so you have the, the data generated by the model for a fixed value of parameters. So the best set of parameters to fit the data generated by the model is obviously the parameters themselves. But you can change these parameters away from the initial values of these parameters. And again, you can compute the Hessian matrix around your initial point. And so you can identify the most relevant directions, the directions that make the model to which the models are most sensitive to, and then move along this direction, and then repeat. Is it like having an ensemble of different models with the... Uh, yes, yes. An averaging of this ensemble? No, 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 you're not averaging. You're actually trying to find your way to explore the different behavior that your model can generate. But if you're moving in directions... So the problem is exploring large amounts of space. And the problem is that if you take a random direction, then what you see from these sloppy idea is that most of the time it's not going to change anything. So you're going to lose your time going in directions where nothing changes. So this is a way to orient your dynamics in, to, to, in order to go in the directions that matter most to your model. And in the end, I mean, there are various ideas that Setna has proposed as well. So for example, you could do the other way around. You could follow the most sloppy directions to infinity or to zero. And once some parameters values are set to infinity or to zero, you can strip them out from the model and you have a lower dimensional model. And you repeat and then in the end you can... You, so this is his proposal to try to construct using that root stylized model that only retain the most relevant combination of parameters. Yes, 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 yes. It's also a renormalization group, if you want. Then there's a question on the chat. Someone was asking if please reactivate the microphone. Hello, can, can I? Can I do my question? Yes. Okay, no. Hi. Hi. Thanks for the seminar. Um, I was wondering uh, if with the models you have presented today, you're actually able to predict, predict quantitatively correctly real life scenarios. For example, I was wondering, uh, for if you take your model about the post-COVID recovery, if you try to put some numbers taken from real-life experience in your model, if you are able to correctly predict if the current uh, recovery we are observing can be either V-shaped or L-shaped, like if you're able to quantitatively predict the phase we are in in real life. I don't know if I explain. So. Yes, no, but, but my point was that it's too early to do that, in my opinion, that we don't have enough understanding of what we want okay. to, to retain as, as relevant features. We, I mean, there's a lot of things in these Mark Zero models that are not taken into account, and we know they're important. So, uh, for example, 
I, I spoke about the Mark Zero model and the firm network model. And what we are trying to work on right now is to try to merge the two, to have a Mark Zero with a firm network mm. model. Uh, so, you know, I think it would be over ambitious to at this point say we have a, a model of the world. But in any case, I, maybe it's not just impossible to do this. Maybe we should forget about the usual stuff that we are doing in, in physics or in, in sciences in general, which is to try to create numbers. I think that in many cases, maybe the best you can do is to predict in what phase you are and what the qualitative behavior of the system is and what are the directions in which it can become unstable. And I think that already doing this without you know, giving numbers it would be great a great progress compared to macroeconomic science as it is now. And I think this is really what I wanted to insist on by quoting Keynes when he says it's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. It means exactly that. It means that if you at least understand what what can happen, it's much better than you know giving... If you read some macroeconomic papers, there are predictions with three decimal di digits, but it's based on models that don't make sense. So. I think it's absurd, and I, I much prefer the idea that maybe we're so. So some people, for example, Don Farmer, who's been constructing agent-based models as well, he's more bullish about the possibility of predicting things. So it, I think in some cases, if your if if your predictions are sufficiently short term, then because there's more and more data, and this was probably is going to change also the field, is the, the fact that you can measure in real time human activity across the world with more and more precisions. And so what they, the group of Doin Farmer in Oxford did during the COVID crisis was to predict the depth of the recession. And, and they were able to do this with surprising accuracy. But I think it's because in a sense, if you put enough information at time T, then inertia, is going to give you something correct at time t plus one. So I'm not saying that it's useless. I think it's it's great work, but it depends on the time scales you're interested in. I think that if you look at what they did at the time, and if you ask the question, is there, is there going to be inflation two years from now? I think their model was just unable to do any to say anything about this. So uh, again, I'm not saying that our model is great because it predicted inflation. This is really not what the message that I want to give. It's just opening the eyes of the modeler to things that can happen that, that you didn't anticipate to start with. I think this is hugely important and may, maybe underrated as a scientific activity. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Maybe mm -hmm. a bit basic question. So, uh, well, you are, let me see if I have interpreted correctly what you told us. Essentially, your main claim is that you can uh, not be so surprised that if you use even agent based or even simple models, you can uh, make very in behavior that sometimes are very hard to predictable according to the theory of complexity and so on and so forth. And so there are this conflict, despite the apparent simplicity of the model, there is still, at this is a question, work to improve models or agent based models or something in that sense. I mean, not they work in that in the many years, because otherwise you can fit anything but with a sufficient and minimal number of parameters to get some information, which is not prediction in the sense that you are talking about. On the other hand, all the examples you show that, essentially say there is a way of reducing, as you were mentioning before, uh, finding strategies for reducing the relevant indicators or relevant variables, if you want to uh, send to many the presentation, as a matter of language. But this may depend on uh, what you are looking for, in some sense, and how the model is really fit to what you want to do, like to do. And on the other hand, it seems to me, this is very common here. People, young people 
Frank made some uh, effort to uh, actually enter the game uh, with the proper tools and probably it would be extremely helpful. On the other hand, as far as I understand, one of the criticisms that you raise to standard models of economy is not only the reality and uh, but I have a feeling that the main concept which I start really to follow after your talk is that speaking about the belief that doesn't make that sense. It is a sense you are in a system which is open, and this is the idea. They change continuously, and we don't know where we are going to go. Sorry for the question. No, I mean, on the last point, I think it's, it's, I mean, there are two things. One is that the equilibrium can change, and that's what economists think, that because you have production shocks, for example, or, or walls or whatever, then, or interest rates, then the equilibrium changes. But the, the economy as a whole is kind of slaves to that equilibrium. It converges immediately to this new equilibrium. Whereas what we see in the kind of models that I've shown is that even if equilibrium is unchanged, is the same for centuries, you could have a, a, an economy that constantly fluctuates around this equilibrium without ever being in equilibrium because the equilibrium becomes unstable, dynamically unstable. And so this is a very simple concept for you know, for our, for our community that you can have an unstable, dynamical unstable equilibrium. But strangely enough, economists take it the other way around. They say, can we invent dynamics that leads to equilibrium? And then the world should be like this because we believe in equilibrium. So it's, it's a very strange you know, way of thinking about the world. Whereas I think that physicists naturally say, okay, well, people, you know, they're humans, they're going to do simple things. And we want these simple things to converge to equilibrium. And if it doesn't, then the concept of equilibrium is just, you know, flawed. And we, uh, uh, concerning your first question, I, I think that you know, at this point, there are patches of things that we understand, but many things we don't. And, uh, so trying to get the uh, kind of minimal model where uh, the, the mechanisms that we believe to be really relevant are already there is a challenge. So for example, the Mark Zero model, as I said, it has a production uh, sector that is far too simple. There's no link between the firms. They don't interact through this firm network mechanism. We also have a, a household sector that is homogeneous. We, so we simplified the household sector, whereas we know that there are strong inequalities, wealth inequalities and income inequalities that must matter. So for example, inflation or recovery, it's not going to be the same for poor people and, and, and rich people. And the way wealth is distributed is going to affect the dynamics of recovery. We know, for example, that rich people have a very much lower propensity to consume in, in relative terms than poor people. So, uh, so imagining that this whole thing is uniform and there's no distinction between households is also completely wrong. So I, I think at this point, it's, it's trying to you know, identify little by little the things that should matter, test whether they matter. If they don't, well, then just simplify them again. If they do, then include them in the model. And in the end, maybe have something that one can trust and go proudly to central banks and say, I think my model is good enough for you to, to use. But even if we're not there, I think that the, the simple Mark Zero model, I think is really useful as a kind of, you know, like pilots, plane pilots who go to flight simulators. I think they learn a lot, even if it's not true. I mean, flight simulators are extremely uh, realistic now, but even if they weren't, I think that just to play a game is is very helpful to uh, yeah to, to, to yeah exactly to capture the mechanisms and to think about the problem you're really trying to solve. But this is this surprisingly is very hard to communicate. You know, it's very hard to say. Forget about the numbers. Forget about predicting inflation with two digits precision for next year. This is not what you. This this is what not what you should be trying to do. 
I mean, people are not prepared to do this yet. No, 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 especially in economics. Other questions? Not from the audience, nor from the online audience. Since uh, questions. No, I can't do that. So, so let's okay. Disappointed that Rosario uh, didn't ask any 